series that we've talked about um, and today the subject is two points in our 10 point vision being Sabbath celebrating the distinct yet inclusive because of the sermons that we've covered so far uh, we've done the one on Christ centred these are the 10 point vision that characterises the Church of God Seventh Day. If somebody said to me, what sort of church are you? Traditionally going back many years we might have compared ourselves, what have I done there? Oh, gone too far. We might have compared ourselves with other Christians saying we do that, they don't do that. But if somebody asks you, you know, how do you, define, how do you describe your church? You say, look, aren't we Christ-centred? We are spirit-formed. We are Bible-based. We are Sabbath-celebrating. We are distinct. We are inclusive. Um, we've also done compassion and service and engaging in witness. Sorry, uh, united in fellowship. So as we go, but today we're going to look at um, number four and five, Sabbath celebrating, distinct yet inclusive. And I hope you enjoy the journey because this is what I would call this series of sermons is our identity in Christ. Who are we and how do we see ourselves in the future and how do we see our grandchildren continuing the faith and people who come along and visit us think, okay, that's not a fire alarm. No. Um, so that's who we are and um, it's grace-oriented. It's a powerfully grace-oriented vision because distinct yet inclusive means we don't compromise what we hold on to from scripture but we're not heavy-handed in our judgment of others we extend grace and um, when we look I don't need to pre present a sermon on the Sabbath but we know it was ordained at creation it was spoken by God written by his finger it was kept by Jesus he said he was the Lord of the Sabbath it was kept by the Apostles it was subverted by Constantine, but it was kept by faithful. The Sabbath is a gift of God to humanity, especially to tired, business-oriented, money-economy-geared 21st century man. And it was a grace given to his ancient people. For 40 years, God said, I'll teach you Sabbath. So manna will be for six days of the week. On Friday, there'll be a double portion. For us, it's a connection between creation, the creation week, and the ultimate divine rest we'll have in Christ. When Jesus says, come to me all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, we celebrate a foreshadow, a type of that each week. Exodus Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy reverberates to us today. This is holy time and we see in Jesus Christ that the Sabbath was intended from no longer doing no work. Jesus actually said on the Sabbath, my father's working and I must do the will of him who, thank you Josh, um, of him who sent me. He showed from no work, don't do servile work, this is holy time, but wow. You are compelled by the nature of God's grace to minister to human need, acts of charity and care. And I remember being on an on a outward bound hike in Denmark and one of the guys halfway through the camp said to me, John, I admire you with your Sabbath. He said, but what if Granny had an accident and had a flat tyre? Would you not help her? I said, oh. see how you sometimes have Judaic principles that cut out compassion? And he was so delighted that that was a burden that he carried, that the Sabbatarianism was just like excluding human need. You know, in Sabbath rest God is glorified and human righteousness is, is humbled. We see human righteousness established by the Pharisees. They had all these raw rules and regulations that you can't dial your phone but you can get your Arab slave to dial your phone or whatever it might be. Anyway, leave it alone. This year, this year or was it last year? We're on the threshold of the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. From the time Constantine said, let no man Judaize anymore, the day of the Lord is Sunday, therefore these wicked Jews, etc, etc. And so the Protestant Reformation and the way Orthodox religion was, from that point, Luther with the beginning of the Protestant Reformation started breaking out of what Constantine had initiated. And the Protestant Reformation today is 500 years old. See, sometimes when you talk about Sabbath, 
I've heard brothers in the, in, in the broader Christian faith say, look, every day is holy now. God doesn't single out one day is holy, every day is holy. Then they'll say, Sunday is the Lord's day because Jesus was resurrected on Sunday morning. Um, the law was done away. Can you answer these from Scripture? I could go into individual points there. But sometimes the, we see aspects of the Protestant Reformation that did not keep on progressing. It got so far. With the Sabbath, Luther hated the Jews. He said their houses should be burned and their rabbis punished. He had a hatred. Early in Luther's ministry, he was very favourable to the Jews. But afterwards, he wrote some terrible treatises of hate. So do you think Luther could have ever introduced the Sabbath back in the Protestant Reformation? So the Reformation, when it started, was flawed to begin with. Now, we can't hold up the banner and say, yes, we are part of the Reformation keeping on going. It's only by God's grace that we are here today and we can actually walk in faith. So the, the Protestant Reformation did some fundamental things. It denied the infallibility of the papacy. It confessed some shocking and egregious historical errors. And for that we stand with our brothers and go, Amen. It placed the Bible into the hands of the common man. That was powerful. Because it's suddenly you and I had the opportunity in translated language. One thing Luther did, he translated the Bible into German, into the common language. So, you know, we look at a man's legacy and you say, well, he was flawed, let's drop him off altogether. No, he did some good things, but he was also flawed. But the Protestant Reformation did not keep moving forward, and we can think of other things that might have contributed to that. But um, had the Protestant Reformation embraced the Sabbath rest, we might have seen a very different face of Christianity today. Very different... We would have been taken across the threshold of the point of no return in the Christian journey. I actually feel because now there's a greater ecumenicalism among the Protestant community and Catholicism. And there's, there's people who say, look, you know, there's not much difference between them. When I was a boy growing up, our school primary class in Tasmania and religion was divided Catholics, Protestants, or, or no religion. So you always had the Catholic group and the Protestant group in different classrooms. We don't even think like that anymore. You know, it's, there's a greater ecumenicalism happening and, and sometimes we wonder that if we don't move forwards where, where God calls us, there's no such thing as standing still, we'll go backwards. If I'm not always loving and nurturing the, the marriage relationship we have, it's going to go stagnant. And going stagnant means it loses it, you see. And so if you look at the history of ancient Israel and their sliding into sin and then revival and repentance, God always held the shepherds of ancient Israel very, very responsible. So you might wonder when you read theologians talk about homosexuality and the Archbishop of Canterbury says to Richard Dawkins, oh, we know so much more about homosexuality than Apostle Paul ever did. So we discount Apostle Paul's writings. You know, and they, these are theologians at Leeds. So you have vast parts of the Christian community who actually are, as I saw on TV, in the Anglican diocese here, yes, we are voting yes for marriage equality. I think, how far have we really gone? I can, uh, but we can, God holds us responsible, so we can ask, what did the first century church look like? And um, I was hoping, Acts 13, 14. On the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. Acts 13, 44. And the next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the whole word of God. So we've got two Sabbaths there. It's just in the book of Acts. Um, and on the Sabbath, in Acts 16, 13, we went outside to a gate in the riverside where we were surprised, supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who were assembled. Acts 17, 2. And Paul, as his manner was, went unto them, and three Sabbaths reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Acts 18, 4 and 11. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and he continued there a year and six months teaching the Word of God to them. So just in a few chapters, we see the Sabbath referenced 84 times as a part of the life and culture of the first century church. Now sometimes the first century church is called by theologians as the primitive church. Because we've moved on to a, a, a Constantine-initiated model. 
not a primitive church, it's an apostolic church. And you gain little glimpses of first century life. And I hope that's helpful as we look at that. But um, even the tolerance of religion, we talk about intolerance of religious faith nowadays. In the 1600s, Britain was very intolerant to any other religions. And you had Sabbatarians and Mennonites and Seventh-day Baptists and, 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 and many of the Sunday-keeping tradition who were so persecuted, they boarded these wooden sailing ships to the unknown New World. And you had in Philadelphia, among them were Sabbatarians to seek peace and quiet and live their own life in a whole new unknown world. Unfortunately, there's nowhere to go today. <laughs> we live in Western Australia, the ends of the earth, so to speak. If you look at us geographically, you know, it's the most, world's most isolated capital city. But there's nowhere to go anymore unless you go in the middle of Australia somewhere in a, in a settlement there. Um, out of this, about 150 years ago, the Church of God Seventh-day Sabbatarian movement emerged. And we began to emerge. The distinctive of our doctrines back then was the re imminent return of Jesus Christ. And... and what surprised a lot of people is that there, you read about the early Church of God Seventh Day, there were Sunday keepers and, and Sabbatarians, it was very loosely organised. But um, what was surprised is that the Sabbath observance wasn't as what Luther feared, full of Talmudic Jewish peripheral and baggage. It wasn't with that at all. Those associations were gone along. And the Churches of God began just simply with the slogan, the Bible and the Bible alone. Because prophets had come and gone, and we can, even within the seven day um, Sabbatarian community, there was Ellen G. White and others who um, brought their own distinctives along. And then um, when we talk about that, so we're even within, not only are we as called out in Christ distinct in the greater community, even within the broader Christian community, we carry with us some distinctives. Now, just because somebody goes to church on Sunday, we don't sort of say, ah, draw the line, although I've heard people do that. We also know that our distinctiveness is touched by God's grace. And we extend grace to all as God leads and moulds and shapes us. And that distinctiveness, this is why I've tied the two subjects that we are Sabbath celebrating, distinct yet inclusive. Because sometimes distinctiveness can be exclusiveness. John and Elizabeth, who attend occasionally from Dalwananyu when they're down here, came from an exclusive brethren background. They left the exclusive brethren 30 years ago. And the exclusivity, he can't do business with previous members. Absolutely at arm's length. You know? It's a different culture, but it does exist in even today's society. So as a desire that we have individually, that brings us together collectively in the body of Christ in this world, we naturally find ourselves living counterculturally. And if you can encourage your children to be strong in the Lord, and that means being countercultural, it takes a lot of stamina, it takes a lot of love, it takes a lot of faith, it takes the work of God's forming Holy Spirit to live in this world. Jesus says, and I won't bring the scriptures up on the screen, Matthew 10, 22, you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Matthew 24, and you will be hated by all nations. For what reason? For my name's sake. See, if I say I'm voting no, I don't get a positive response in the media. I use that as example. You know, they say, oh, you know, you're being hateful, bigoted, etc. To live distinctly is also to live counterculturally. And the Sabbath is a countercultural step in sync with the Lord, um, that counterculturalness comes from a description of Jesus in Hebrews 1.9 where you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Think of that equation. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. And as Christ is being formed in us, we love the righteousness of God the fruits of his spirit. How did Lot feel in Sodom and Gomorrah? He was a man praying every day, even though he was tainted by that society. As we see some of the narrative in his story. He must have been there praying because Scripture says the cry has come out before the throne of God. 
And God comes down administering justice. He doesn't go vroom and burn the place up. He comes down and sends his angels and says, let's go and check this out. And we see it played out in the human narrative of his life. And yet, being in a society, sometimes we become part of that society. Lot says, don't you rape these men, but you can rape my daughters. Oh, that stings. <laughs> His righteousness and God was even diminished living in that society. This is why Jesus prayed in the Lord's Prayer, deliver, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. And we are living in, in these kind of days. So on issues on abortion, on euthanasia, on homosexuality, on a fornication. We don't have a discussion in the Christian circles about fornication. That should be ahead of some of these other discussions. What about violence? You know, we do live in a violent world because it's brought to our television screens every night as entertainment. We face a challenge, but can I ask you, which side of history do you want to be on? in the day of judgment? It's an easy answer. When you live with your heart and mind in the things of God and fix your eyes on the kingdom of God, not on the things of this earth, then that equation is easily answered. Yes, our journey in the churches of God has had its failings. We have let people down. You read the history of the Church of God's seventh day of the last 150 years, and we've had been very slow in some doctrinal areas. That's why we declare an open creed we learn and look at the Word of God and mould and shape accordingly. Um, you know, we, we can suffer all spiritual blindness, and that's been part of our history. Are we willing to confess our sins and say, God, continue your good work? I think you'll never find a perfect church, but you'll find humble people walking in that direction as the Lord and Saviour leads, and that's very encouraging. That's why we sing in moving forward, you know, onward Christian soldiers. There's a beautiful pacing. There's no such thing as standing still. If you're not moving forwards, you're moving backwards. And I mentioned that earlier. And the song, Onward Christian Shoulders, mean that we're on a journey to the promised land, to the kingdom of God. We're moving forward to stand. Sometimes in life you have to stand still. By the Red Sea, God said to Moses, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. But as soon as the Lord moved, then everybody had to move forward. But sometimes you've got to stand still. But we will move when the Lord bids. And sometimes when the Lord shows you something from Scripture, we are compelled to move. If we don't move on it, if God gives you His Holy Spirit and you resist it, like the Saul did, we see a, a tragedy in his life. So we spend a lifetime growing and moving forward in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. That's why we are Christ-centred. We live our lives onward, Upward and outward, moving forward to the kingdom of God, upward in worship and praise and adoration of God, and outward, there's flooding in Texas. Is there anything that we can do? The International Ministerial Congress is raising a donation. Can we be generous on the day? All we're asking for every member is to give one dollar. And out of 200,000 members around the world, there's $200,000. Now, a wealthy per country like ourselves, let me pull out $10. <laughs> Minimum. <laughs> I can't stand before God in the judgment and say, on the day I gave a dollar, like everyone else. God says, to whom much is given, much is required. And so it's a personal thing between you and God. As we grow and we press on towards the kingdom of God, we find in Jesus Christ, as Christ centered, that he, John describes him in John chapter 1, verse 14, as being full of grace and truth. Actually, I've got it on the screen. We beheld his glory. The glory is of the, begotten, begotten of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. May we live our lives in our journey being full of grace and truth, holding on to the truth, but being filled with inclusiveness, extending unmerited favour. Grace is very hard, because as you're being crucified, either by society today or by Roman soldiers, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> That's hard. If you have an unbelieving spouse that nails into you for your faith, and you've got to look kindly at that person and say, Father, forgive them, they don't know. That's hard. That's really hard. And that's the cross that Jesus has called us to carry. Full of grace and truth. See, grace is powerful, it's not weak. And it's hand in hand with truth. See, the Pharisees cherished truth. 
They showed they placed heavy burdens, even robbing widows' houses in the name of truth. And Jesus held that against them. Grace makes us distinct, but makes us inclusive in that distinctiveness. The warm, loving, friendly, loving hand. Grace enables us to extend forgiveness to when people don't deserve it. And grace equips us to show favour even to our Sunday-keeping brethren with whom we are hoping and anticipating revival. We are hoping that the Protestant Reformation continues not into Judaism but into the very presence of Christ. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. And perhaps living as being Christ-centred and countercultural, we can be a catalyst, an agent for God's grace for however he wants to lead. To be Sabbath-celebrating, to be distinct yet inclusive in a grace-oriented mindset, it takes courage, it takes faith, it takes patience. Revelation talks about the patient endurance of the saints living the life that we have today. But the result is that when people come to meet you, they meet Jesus. You are full of grace and truth. And they meet Jesus. You might be 80 years old. You might be 15 years old. You're boy or female. Whatever ethnic, ethnicity you are, what language you speak, you reflect the hands and the eyes and the ears and the truth and the grace of Jesus Christ. Jesus said of his disciples, greater things than these miracles that he's done, you will do. And we think, what greater thing can we do? That's what Jesus said. See, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath and he showed charitable works. And in, in his distinctiveness, he shocked the religious order of the day by eating with sinners, with Pharisees. They said if they knew what sort of woman was touching him, she was a sinner. She had a broken life. She was seeking repentance. See, to ancient Israel, their sign of their relationship with God was the Sabbath. Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you, says God, throughout your generations, that you may know that I and the Lord sanctify you. I set you aside from everyone around. Today, the sign of a holy Christian, of a Christian is the seal of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit leads us into all truth. And um, very powerful. You see how God's Spirit leads and guides. So when you know the Lord, and we become really familiar with His Word, that's why we have Scripture reading. When you're confronted by your own inadequacy, you turn and repent. You know what Scripture does? All of heaven rejoices. And when you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour, and came out of the waters of baptism, heaven rejoiced. And the kingdom of God won another citizen. The world's age and our society has a metaphor. It's called Babylon. It started off in Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. It comes all the way down through history, through all the big image that, Bab that, 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 that Nebuchadnezzar saw, head of gold, feet of iron and clay. God says to these pe his people in Revelation, right at the very end, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins. There's a calling to be distinct, to be you, God's own peculiar, unique people. Because to take part of her sins is to share in the consequences, the plagues that, are, that affect. I quoted that scripture not out of negativism, but as a warning from the living God speaking to us. I want you to be distinct. What does it take? Our mandate is to reflect the living Christ in this world. It's our calling. And God has not left us ill-equipped. He's given us his Holy Spirit in abundance. Like on John chapter 7, anyone who's thirsty, let him come to me and drink, and I will, he can drink from me, and out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Rivers go and water everything around. To live counterculturally is to identify and live in Jesus Christ. We are Sabbath celebrating. We are distinct. But by God's grace, we are inclusive. Grace and truth are never compromising. We extend grace and kindness in the truth of God's word to 
to those who don't yet understand that scripture says that men may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven.